The Rebel Capitalist Show. All right, guys, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to welcome someone to the Rebel Capitalist Show that I have really been looking forward to speaking with. His name is Jamie Keach, and he's partners with my good buddy and Rebel Capitalist Pro, Chris McIntosh. Jamie is an expert in precious metals, and he specializes in private placements. So I want to dive into that with him today to help you understand how you might be able to outsize your returns in this gold and silver bull market that I think we're in right now. So Jamie, welcome to the Rebel Capitalist Show. Thanks for having me today, George. All right. So for those of my viewers who might not know your full backstory, can you get us up to speed? So yeah, my name is Jamie Keach. I am the co-founder uh, and the chief editor of Resource Insider. And as you kind of mentioned there, my partner on this is Chris McIntosh. He's been on your show a few times. I think your, yep. your audience knows them him pretty well. And we started Resource Insider together back in uh, early 2018. And Chris and I had been talking for probably about six months. We'd gotten introduced to by some mutual friends. And we knew we wanted to create a product to go after opportunities in the mining and the natural resource sector. The people who've had Chris, who've listened to Chris on your show before know, know that he's a macro guy and he knew he wanted to start allocating capital into gold, into commodities, into silver, all these things. But you know, he'll tell you himself, he's not a mining guy. He didn't know how to do it and he didn't know the good from the bad when it comes to opportunities and deals and really how to not to lose your shirt in this space, which is pretty easy if you're not careful. So yeah. I came in, uh, I have the exact opposite background of Chris. I'm a mining engineer and I really started from the ground up. So I've spent my entire career in the mining space. I'm based here in Vancouver now, but I didn't start there. I've worked on mine sites and exploration projects all over the world from Albania to Mongolia to Peru to Colombia, um, exploring for gold and then helping build mines later in my career. And then most recently, when Chris met me, I was working here in Vancouver in corporate development, uh, helping to build a new company. And we took that company from when I joined, I was the fourth employee. I was the first technical employee there. We took it from a $20 million market cap uh, to a multi, multi-billion dollar market cap where it is today, and that's Equinox Gold. So people who are listening to this are probably familiar with Equinox Gold. The chairman is Ross Beatty. So I was there when we merged with, with his company and we created that. And I left when we were about a billion dollar market cap to go and launch Resource Insider because I could see the writing on the wall that we were entering a really, really strong commodities market. I wanted right. to go and position myself. Chris wanted to position himself and we wanted to you know, get our members involved as well. So, so that's the background. I'm a technical person with a finance um, it's a lot of finance experience and my career up into running this newsletter has been building resource companies and mines on the ground as well. Yeah. Where were we in Colombia? Oh, so I was, um, I mean, I stayed in Medellin, but I was only there for about six weeks in, uh, uh, in the Southwest of the country. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if Chris told you, but I've been doing a ton of real estate in Medellin since really? 2000. Yeah, right around Park Yaris and Provenza. I'm sure that's kind of uh, where you were hanging out when you were there. Yeah, but yeah, uh, yeah. I don't want to get too far off topic. That's there, Golden Mile area, right? That's yeah, a, yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. My the, friend's wife owns a, a nice hotels there, and we stayed in that hotel the whole time, and it was it was really cool. I, I love. I you would not have to twist my arm to get me to come back to Colombia. I would say. Yeah, yeah. That okay. I don't want to get off on too far of a tangent. There, so, <laughs> I know that's not why people are listening to this episode, but the reason they are listening because they're very interested in gold and silver. So we've seen it just really break out lately. Silver is just you know crushing it. Uh, where do you see the market right now? All right, hold on. I'm gonna pull up my phone here so I have the most up to date information. So as okay. we say, record this. <laughs> we're at two thousand thirty dollar gold, right? And we're at $29 silver. All right. Okay. So okay. a year ago, gold was at $1,500. We've seen a huge year. Two years ago, it was at $1,200. So I don't think anyone listening to this needs me to make the case that we are in a precious metals bull market. For sure. What people might be less familiar with is the significance of the gold and silver ratio. 
So the gold and silver ratio, you know, gold is a pure precious metal. Basically, you know, 99% of its vap of its use is as a store of value in bullion. Mm -hmm. Silver is a bit of a hybrid. Um, it's a precious metal, but it's also an industrial metal. Something like 30% of all silver is used in high-end electronics and this and, and, and industrial uses beyond just bullion. So right. what we tend to see uh, in a precious metals bull market is gold goes first. And gold has been very, very aggressively on the move the last, I mean, particularly the last three or four months. Um, but silver tends to lag behind, and that's because of these industrial uses. But we're seeing real strong movements in silver right now. So silver has uh, essentially doubled since March of this year. And you might think that you've kind of missed the window on that now if you're watching this. And so we got into silver. My members got into silver last November, a company called Vizela Resources. We got in at 40 cents. You know, we've seen a six time return on that stock already. Now they went out and they made a discovery. We backed the right team. But a lot of that had to do with silver doubling in the meantime. Sure. But for those who kind of think they missed the boat on this, you know, what's important is to look at the historic gold and silver ratio. So historically, it's been about 47 to 1. So that means 47 ounces of silver is worth one ounce of gold. Today, it's worth about 70 to 1. So there is still that room to see silver come up and close that gap. And when that gap starts to close, that's the surest sign we are in a bull market. And so we're seeing that movement, but I think it's got a long way to go. And it's, it's important to note that so it's not closing in a vacuum. Gold is not static, right? Gold is going up and silver is going up. So I kind of think the silver trade is just getting started. We just closed another deal uh, at Resource Insider. Um, massive, massive silver project run by the ex-COO of Barrick, uh, located in the United States, super undervalued. And it's insane how cheap we got into this. And I think it's frankly because the market is just kind of starting to wake up to what's going on here. And this deal was massively oversubscribed. You know, they went out to raise $10 million and they ended up raising twice as much of that. So mm -hmm. that's an appetite for what, or rather that's an example of the appetite that's starting to build for silver but we're not quite seeing it reflected in the share prices. So I think you would, you could not have a better time to be entering the silver market than right How now. How long do precious metals bull markets usually run? You know, I think there's a couple ways to look at this. Um, we entered this space in 2018. And in 2018, we could sort of see the writing on the walls that money had to start flowing into commodities. And that almost always starts with precious metals, particularly gold. And when we started going out and doing financings, investing in deals, we had no competition. You know, this first two year period, companies were begging us for money. We could get in on almost any terms that we set. And we got right. some really, really good deals done. And for people who are watching this now, they've missed that window. You know, you're you work in real estate, right, George? So the way I kind of look at that, when I lived in Toronto, I remember being, I was a student at the time, there were condos for sale, uh, pre-construction, a lot of pre-construction. And at the time, you could get in, buy those pre-construction condos for a fraction of the price that they would be worth when, when they were built. And that was the beginning of a, of a hot uh, real estate market, I would say. True. Now, today we're kind of, the condos are starting to be built. So... Things are starting to heat up. People are being more aggressive getting in. But we probably have another two-year window where there are still really great deals to be had. And there are still really great opportunities in this. And then I think things are just going to go crazy after that. And, right. you know, we saw that. I'll use Toronto again as an example. The housing market just took off like in so many other places in the world. And now you buy those those damn pre-construction condos and they're the same price or more as the existing condos. And it's, you know, that, that, um, bump you were getting for taking that risk. It doesn't exist anymore. So we're not there in the mining market, but that, that day will come that day historically comes. So I kind of look at this as you've kind of got a two to four year window where you really have the opportunity to allocate into these markets and then take advantage of really the mania that comes after that. So, I'd say, you know, we're halfway through, you know, we're, we're two years in of a four year timeline. That's, that's our prediction. Yeah, that makes sense. 
So I want to get down into the granular stuff. I, I usually kind of stay at the macro level, but you're just a, a bottoms up guy, as you've said before, and you've got such a, a massive expertise there. So I want to try to uh, learn from that as, as we're speaking. Just kind of walk me through the, the basics of how the, these, these deals that you keep saying you're doing deals, and I'm assuming that's a private placement deal. How do these things actually work from, from yeah. A to Z? It's a good question, and I should probably take a step back. So what Resource Insider does is we go out and we look for private placement investment opportunities in the mining and natural resource sector. What that means. So what that means is I go out and find a deal that I want to invest my own money in, uh, and then I bring that to our members, and I say, look, it, I'm investing X percent of my capital into this opportunity. If you yeah. want to do it, this is how you do it, and you can come in on the same terms as me. Here's all my research. Here's the reasons I'm doing it. Here's the opportunities. Here's the risks. And for your listeners who have not heard of private placements before, it sort of sounds a little complicated or intimidating, but it's actually pretty simple. Uh, yeah. When these mining companies are looking to raise capital, so when they need money to go out and do whatever it is they're doing, drill holes or buy a new project or redevelop an asset, doesn't matter. They need to get that capital from somewhere. And they basically have two options, right? They can either sell equity or they can take debt. Now, most of the companies in the junior mining space in particular do not produce the cash flow. They don't make any money. They're venture stage companies. So debt is almost never an option for them. So what they do is they go out and raise money via equity. Now, this is where I'm coming. So if a company is going out, they're going to issue more shares and they'll sell that to investors. And that can be a hedge fund, a bank, a private equity firm, an ultra high net worth individual, or it can be anyone that is an accredited investor, a retail investor that meets accredited status. Got what it. that typically means, it depends where you're located in the world. But if you're in Canada or the United States, for example, it means you either make you make more than $200,000 per annum and have done for the last two years, or you have more than a million dollars uh, in invested capital, not including your primary residence. So it means you have a certain amount of wealth or income, and the government has decided that people who meet that threshold are sophisticated enough to make these investments. And whether that's true or not is irrelevant. That's just the, the, the rules that have been set. Mm -hmm. So if you are an accredited investor, what you can do is you can go out and buy that stock directly from the company. So unlike buying shares uh, over the stock market, you know, the New York Stock Exchange, or the Toronto Stock Exchange, you're not buying it from another investor. You're buying it directly from the company. Got it. And why that is so unique is because, because the company is trying to raise capital, because they, they want to incentivize people to buy that stock, they often give a bit of a sweetener. They give you a bit of a sweetheart deal. So that can include um, a discount, for example. So if the stock is trading on the market at a dollar, they might be able to offer it to uh, investors who want to participate in their private placement at 80 cents, for example. Mm -hmm. The other thing they very commonly offer is something called warrants. And warrants are essentially an option, the option to purchase uh, shares above a given price, so or at a given price, rather. So maybe they're trading at a dollar in the market, they'll offer an 80 cents, uh, 80 cents or 20% discount. And then maybe they'll offer a full warrant at call it a dollar 10. So at any price, the share, the share price goes above a dollar 10, that warrant is now in the money. So if the share price goes to $2, that warrant is worth 90 cents, you get 90 cents of basically free money. So it's the sweetener uh, to reward these investors that take this sort of risk. So our go goal is to go out, find these things, the ones that are good discounts, lots of warrants, uh, and have a great chance, in my view, as an engineer and a, and a mining finance guy, of success. And we put our own money in, and our, our, uh, the investors we work with, our members, they have the option to put their money in as well. And yeah, that's, I'm sure that's Chris do. goes in with in a lot of those deals as well, so I would assume, with his own money. Chris so. and I invest in every deal we cover. Yeah, that, that's what I figured. And the, the reason it's so important to have kind of someone with your expertise there is because in general, uh, the mining business is just terrible. And most of these guys or gals go out of business. 
And so, yeah, you can go out there and get warrants or you can do all these things from any business, but that doesn't mean that they'll be in business <laughs> a month yeah. from now. And if they're not in business, those warrants aren't going to do you too much good. So it's really crucial to have someone there that's doing the boots on the ground research that really, really knows what they're doing. So you're, you're picking a lot more winners than losers. So, the, you know, there are opportunities to very commonly make two or three times your money in mining stocks easily. We do it all the time at Resource Insider. There are also opportunities to make 10 times your money. Um, but there are even more opportunities to lose absolutely everything <laughs> you invested in and, and your self-respect right, along right. with it if you're not careful. Yeah. Um, and that's, you know, that, there's basically two reasons for that. Uh, one, you know, first of all, mining is cyclical. If you get the timing wrong, uh, you know, it's hard to win in this space if we're not in a strong market. Um, mining is hard, you know. Yeah. Most of these companies are venture stage companies. They're going out and they're testing a hypothesis. You know, you could be the smartest, most capable, um, you know, most ethical team in the world. And you've got an idea that, you know, there's a mine there and, and all the data on the surface and the geophysical data and everything you've been looking at adds up to that. You go and drill a couple holes in it, and it's not there, and then you're you're hooped. Like there's nothing to be done at that point, and that happens to good teams all the time. So it's a hard business to make money in, but yeah. it's also a business that is full of scam artists. You know that that old quote, um, "What's a mine? It's like a hole. What's it's it's just a hole next with a liar standing next to it." The Mark Twain quote. <laughs> yeah. I think like that <laughs> summarizes the business even today because. You have to, it, mining is such a unique business because it's a venture business that is primarily publicly listed companies. And so there is an opportunity to manipulate share prices and it's a business that attracts liars because there is so much opacity, right? You can make a good case. There's so much unknown and unknown unknowns in mining that you never know it's there. So it attracts people that can tell a good story and they can get by saying, oh, you know, we thought it would work out. So it's a really hard business. It's really easy to get taken advantage of. However, if you understand the players and you know the people and you know the reputation and you can tell the good from the bad, if you can actually go and look at these assets and make a, you know, a quantitative evaluation of it, there is a lot of opportunity. And that's what we focus on at Resource Insider, helping people do that. So, Jamie, when you're looking for these companies and the ones that you think have the, the best uh, percentage chance of doing well long term, uh, what are you looking for specifically? I mean, help us kind of understand your thought process. Yeah, I mean, listen, there's a lot that goes into it, but I think that, you know, there are three things that I think about very, very constantly when I'm looking at these things and any investor should be thinking about so, I mean, the first in mining is you really, really are betting on a management team's ability okay. to execute on a deal. Yep. Sounds simple. It is simple, but most people get this wrong. And we have a pretty, we have a pretty consistent rule that we use for almost everything we do. We invest in people that have done exactly what they're saying they're going to do before. And that is it. That is the best litmus test for future success is past success. Right. A good example of that is a company we invested in last year called Eclipse Gold. It's run by a gentleman named Mike Allen. He had previously made a discovery in Nevada, a gold discovery where he bought a project out of another company, explored it, redeveloped the asset. I think he bought it for $17 million. Uh, less than a year later, he sold it for $100 million. Done, made shareholders a lot of money. Skip ahead mm -hmm. a couple of years, He's got another project now in Eclipse Gold. It's the Hercules project. Bought it out of another company. Gold asset in Nevada. And now he's redeveloping it. That's exactly what we're looking for. Someone who has a proven model, has proven they understand what they're doing and have the ability to execute on that. And most importantly, have the ability to make shareholders money. And almost everything we've done has fit that model. It would have to be a very, very special case. And where... People sometimes get this wrong is they think like, oh, this guy's, you know, worked at Barrick, a big mining company, or he's sold another asset. But, you know, for example, running a copper mine in Chile is not the same thing as exploring for a greenstone gold deposit in northern Ontario. These are, you know, these are different skill sets altogether. Uh, they right. might as well be different industries. So we, we're very careful in 
who we back. They have to have a reputation for integrity. They have to have a reputation for success. So that's number one. Uh, number two is, of course, we do uh, an in-depth technical analysis of anything that we're investing in, and it has to it has to stand out. It has to have the potential to deliver multi-time returns. And we invest across the spectrum and across commodities for that matter too. So we've invested in operating gold mines in Arizona. We've invested in lithium exploration companies in Argentina. What they all have in common is, you know, besides a great team, an asset that I've spent time looking through that I've called on my relationships and the consultants I work with, particularly geologists who are specialists in that exact type of deposit and gone through it and said, okay, does this thesis play out? If they're able to deliver on what they say they can do, will this make us a significant amount of money? And what is the likelihood of that? So, you know, this is the process that any serious, you know, mining investment firm, hedge fund, private equity firm, whatever, this is what they do. And, you know, one of my biggest pet peeves in the world is in the newsletter industry in particular, everyone's sort of painting themselves as the guru that knows everything. And, you know, that's that's bullshit in mining because great mining investments are made by leveraging great teams. And having spent 15 years working with technical teams, I have surrounded myself with great people that I draw upon consistently to, to make these decisions. So number two. Finally, number three, and this is uh, something that often gets overlooked in this space is the structure of the company. There is a lot of opportunities for management teams or early shareholders to make money and the people that come in down the line and invest later to make nothing at all. Um, right. Often these share structures are totally blown out. So what I mean by that is I want to see who owns what stock in this company. I want to see what price they got it at. And I want to be sure that we are aligned with management and that management teams cannot make themselves a ton of money without also making me an investor money as well. So those are the three things that we're really focused on. Management, assets, and financial structure of the company. Got it. One thing I was curious about with oil going so low back a few months ago, and it's still relatively low, how much does that benefit uh, gold miners? Gold is going up and oil is going down on yeah. most on okay. most mines, uh, particularly large open pit mines. You know, diesel costs are one of, if not the biggest uh, operating expense of a mine. Right. So when you're getting the cost of that cut in half, potentially, you know, this takes a massive hit out of the operating cost. And then, you know, look ahead that your product is now worth, you know, 25, 30 percent more. It's a yeah. it's a very, very good time for miners right now. I've got so much respect for for Ross Beatty, and obviously, you know, everyone knows him in the business and everything. But it, having the opportunity to work with Ross, I don't know how long you're able to kind of uh, talk to him and go back and forth and pick his brain and learn from him. But what were some of the things that that made him stand out, and what were some of the things that you learned from him uh, that might help just average investors? Yeah. So I will say, um, you know, I worked for Equinox for about three and a half three years. Uh, Ross was there, or I should say the predecessors of Equinox for that long. And then Ross was there for about the last year that I worked there. Okay. And when I started Resource Insider, one of the things I did fairly early on is I sat down with Ross and I did a podcast that I recorded, which you can find on our YouTube channel, just Resource Insider. And I talked to him for an hour and trying to, you know, based on my experience working with him and then trying to figure these things out. And yeah. what I will say is something I've noticed with him and almost all of the very, very, very successful people that we meet have one thing in common. And first of all, they have an insanely amount of high energy. They're very high energy people. They yep. go, 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 go. You know, that's the only way to, to, to do what they do. It's same thing in the entrepreneurial world. Yeah. Exact same thing. Yeah. But the other thing is they have a weird ability to focus on both breadth and depth. And... What I've noticed is all the really successful entrepreneurs have in common is they kind of start like this and they start really wide. And, you know, Ross talks about this early in his career. He's looking at 10,000 projects all over the world and he's flying to Latin America and Russia and all the rest. And he's basically whizzing around, getting deals done and doing this, that and the other. And then it, they all to a point when they've got these 10 deals on a go and all of a sudden that one starts to look like, all right, that's where the money's gonna be made. 
They're able yeah. to sort of hone in with this laser focus on that one and kind of deprioritize everything else and then right. like focus, focus, focus and make that into the millions or hundreds of millions or billions of dollars in some case. And, you know, Ross is doing that today with Equinox Gold. You know, Equinox Gold, he'll tell you, is his primary focus. He's the chairman there. He's built it up, you know, and it's, you know, I think it's on track to become the next Gold Corp or something of, of that similar. It's a very aggressively growing and very well run mining company. And but you see this with everyone. It's uh, starting with breadth and then focus, learning to focus. Because so many people are good at the breadth, but they never know which of the million things they're trying to do really right. deserves their attention. And then others, uh, like I'm an engineer, and this is a problem engineers have a lot is, you know, kind of having the blinders on and the eyes down and being so focused on that one narrow thing they're doing that they, they miss the wider opportunities. And I remember early in my, my uh, career uh, when I was finishing school, I got pitched on doing a, a, a master's degree where I could become the world expert on cable bolts, where it's like the bolts you screw into the side of the thing that they use a the cable and they grout them with um, cement and it's like, it helps ground support. And I just remember thinking like, that is not <laughs> something I want to be the world expert in. And it's, it's an important, important part of mining. It's essential, but it's a good example of the typical engineering mindset where you, your, your view can, if you're not careful, be so narrow that you kind of miss the bigger opportunities. What do you guys do to try to differentiate yourself from the people I'm sure you're competing with for a lot of these deals? What we do differently, I think what differentiates Resource Insider um, and myself is really, we have an unusual combination of skill sets on our team and access on our team. Um, you know, I, I kind of look at making really, really good investments requires two things. You need to have an informational advantage. And in the case of mining, I have an informational advantage because I'm a mining engineer. I've spent my career in this space. I understand what I'm looking at far, far better than certainly the average person, but even the average mining investor that maybe doesn't have the background of working in mines and helping build companies. The yeah. second is you need an access advantage. And to your point is these deals are not easy to get into. Uh, they were certainly two years ago. Um, you know, any money, any rather any company would take any amount of money from any person that was willing to offer it. That mm -hmm. game has changed now. Uh, and there is a there is a limited supply of product available, and that's investment opportunities, and there is a surplus of cash. So you need to be able to get access to these projects. And the reason I'm able to do that is I've spent my career in this space, solely in this space, building relationships. I work in downtown Vancouver. I've worked very, very closely um, with some of the most successful people in this sector, and I can thank my time at Equinox Gold for the ability to to work and meet with Ross Beatty, to you know, and the Christian Milau and Greg Smith, the leaders of that company, to work closely with Sandstorm Gold. I initially started that company started in their office, so I got to meet them and Pathway Capital, uh, and many many other people. So we have an unusual amount of access. So I think what makes us differentiated is we have better access to opportunity. I have a better ability to then sort that opportunity and focus on what we want to be doing. You know, we're pretty picky. I look at, you know, I don't even know how many hundreds of deals every year. I, I think last year we did the math on it. It was 340 or something like that. Last year we did about eight deals, you know, of that 340. This year I'd say we're on track for 10. Uh, and I've looked at more this year for sure, just with the volume that's going on in the market. So we're able to get into these deals because we have a following of very smart, sophisticated shareholders that understand what they're doing. Often they're around for the long term uh, and, and you know, companies want to work with us. Uh, we create a lot of great podcasts and content and whatnot, and we really just focus on the deals we're invested in. And so, yeah, it's interesting how the, the leverage, the negotiating leverage goes back and forth between the investor and yeah. the company and how many different dynamics are in play there. You always like to do business with people you know, like, and trust. Yeah. So I'll, I'll give you an example of how we do that. So a good, a good way, a good example is what not everyone might know. Uh, for a company to, to list on a stock exchange, 
it needs a certain number of shareholders. It needs what's called distribution. So a lot of these companies that we invest in, we invest in them pre-IPO in an earlier stage. And typically we try to get in, you know, four to six months before they're listing because there's all sorts of ways you get bumped up when you're listing to make money. But they need extra shareholders. And often the stock is held by a small group of insiders, maybe a big fund or something like that. When Resource Insider comes in, you know, we can bring a couple hundred people at any given time that will come into that stock and provide the distribution they need along with capital so that then they can go list on the market. So that's been one of our uh, operational advantages because companies always need someone like us to come in. And then once they list, you know, we are uh, first and foremost, we are a newsletter. So we do podcasts, we do videos, we do articles, and we tell the world why we're investing in these companies and why we did those deals. So we offer, uh, we offer an advantage that they can't typically get from the average investor. Can you just get a little more granular on why mining is such a difficult business? I think the average person, and I'd throw myself in there, you think, well, how hard can it be to just dig a hole in the ground and, and pull out some rocks and then, and then sell them to, to a buyer? You know, so why on earth is this business so darn difficult? Okay, so I can explain that very easily. Can you think of another business where you don't know what you have because until you start mining, you can do all the exploration in the world, you can have a good idea of it, but you don't know 100% what's there. Mm. You don't know um, how much it's gonna cost you to produce that, the cost of actual mining that. Again, you make estimates, but they're almost always wrong. And so getting it out of the ground inevitably tends to cost more than people think it will. And then third, you don't know what price you can sell it at because you might start that mine when gold price is $2,000 an ounce. And by the time it's ready to actually sell the commodity, you know, maybe gold is $1,200 an ounce again. So yeah, right. there are so many unknown unknowns in mining that it requires one, highly, highly competent people, and two, it requires a degree of luck in so far that you need to get your timing right. Now, you know, I haven't always been a newsletter writer and, you know, it's very likely I won't always be a newsletter writer because you want to be a newsletter writer in the period where you can make people money. And I believe we're in that period now, which is why we launched Resource Insider when we did. But the day may come when we enter, the day will inevitably come when we enter a bad bear market. And that might be three or four years away. That might be 10 years away. I don't know. But when the writing's on the wall, I don't want to sell people a product to help them invest in something that's not going to make them money. But right yeah. now we do have this unique window, I think, where the timing is right. And when the timing is right, it really helps to set off, to offset rather those other difficulties that I was mentioning. Yeah, for sure. What would you look for to that would signal, okay, the market might be topping right now? Like, like what types of things typically happen? I remember going back to... Um, I think it was 2011. It was the top of the last uh, bull market. And I, I didn't know much about invest. In fact, I didn't really know anything at all. But I remember noticing I was in Phoenix at the time. And I remember like every I was at my buddy's house just uh, with his kids watching TV. And like every single channel I clicked on had a commercial about we buy gold. And then I took his kids like to the local mall. And there were there were kiosks, you know, that you see in, in, in the middle, like as you walk down the, the hall with a store on each side and all those little carts they have that set up, that say the massager, or the lotion or whatever. And I saw that like two or three kiosks in this one mall were dedicated to we buy gold. Yeah. And I'm like, what is going on here? Like, like <laughs> something, something's weird. And like every single person I was talking to, I don't know if it was Halloween or something like that, but you know, you go to these cocktail parties and everybody's buying gold and their cousins are buying gold. And it, it's just like, what is going on here? So from a, like a human psychological standpoint, it seems like that is something to really look for. And I'm not saying we're there now, but yeah. what, as an expert, what do you typically look for? So that's a good point. And that's really, you know, what you saw happening was in the actual physical commodity space of physical gold. 
but it gets even crazier and more manic in the equities. So, I mean, I think we've been seeing that the last couple of years in tech, right? With like SoftBank as an example, oh, just right, right, companies right. or rather investors, generalist investor, generalist investors piling in billions of dollars or hundreds of millions of dollars into companies that have egregious valuations, make no money, have no prospect of ever making any money and run by people with no experience, you know? Mining's kind of different than tech. It's even worse, right? Because one, in mining, there are a finite number of good projects. So at, like in tech, you can always come up with good ideas. In mining, like there's only so many good assets and there's only right. so many people capable of managing those assets in the company as well. So what you first start to see is basically a bunch of idiot CEOs start to pop up. Uh, and these are guys that have no experience in the space, probably a couple of years ago, they were running a marijuana company or a blockchain company. And then they start, you know, they see the money shift and they're like, turns out I'm a gold miner. I missed my calling the whole time. Uh, right, right. So that's one thing you start to see. Then you also see people leaving super lucrative jobs to go run a junior mining company. I remember uh, in 2008, seeing a lot of like investment bankers, guys that were making over a million bucks a year, leave that profession to go run a junior mining company. And you gotta be like, you know, how is, how does that math work where that guy thinks he can make more money in a company with no revenue stream and that he has no competency or experience in running? So you, you start to see stuff like that. Then within the industry, it's even more apparent. So you start to see the price of things go up. Um, in, you know, 2000 and I wanna say 2007, eight, like it was impossible impossible nearly to buy haul truck tires. So you know those massive trucks with the tires that are like bigger than humans and bigger than yeah, you know, yeah, pickup trucks? Yeah, totally. You couldn't buy them anywhere. You couldn't buy them at any price. The companies that made them, manufactured them, couldn't make them fast enough because they were flying off the shelves. I worked in an exploration program in Albania at that time. And I worked with a driller, a guy who sits by a drill, drilling a hole in the ground all day, making 250 grand a year who told me, he was like, you know, I own my house, I own three cars, I own four snowmobiles, I don't know what to spend money on anymore. And it's just like the cost of services start to rise as well. Yeah. Uh, I'm a good example. I got hired in 2007, my first job at a university. I knew nothing. And I think I was making like $140,000 a year at the time. Uh, and I was like, this is great. Like, I don't need to know anything. I can just show up, I'm gonna be well paid. Uh, and then that changed like that in 2008, we saw the first crash. And I graduated in 2007, where I got offered every single job I applied for basically without an interview. And then in 2008, when we had that dip, there were no jobs available for anyone. And it's, uh, it happens very quickly. But when you get this manic buying, manic hiring, and then of course, the inflations of services within the industry, I think that is one of the surest, surest signs that you're in a a bull market. And, and we're not seeing that yet at all. People are saying, uh, oh, you know, it's been, a bull, it's been a crazy run in gold. It has not been a crazy run in gold. You know, gold went from uh, 300 and something dollars in the last run to over $1,900, right? We've gone from 1500 to 2000. So when people are saying gold's going to go to $3,000, that is not an egregious um, estimate by any means. And we haven't seen miners take off the way I would expect them to in a true bull market. I think like yeah. we're sort of in, you know, inning three of a, of a baseball game here. And for uh, your non-American uh, viewers, there are nine innings in baseball. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's a great analogy. It takes me back to a conversation I had with Rick Rule, where he was talking about the overall portfolio allocation of asset managers to gold. And I can't remember the specific numbers, but I, I, I think it was something going back to the early 80s or the late 70s when it was at a high of, say, uh, maybe 8% or something like that. And then since then, it's averaged about maybe 5%. And when I was talking to Rick, this was maybe four or five months ago, it was at like 1%. So yeah. even yeah. though it's gone up quite a bit since then, still the allocation isn't even close to its historic norm. So you, I think that third inning analogy is, is spot on. But I, I think one of the problems, though, is that 
you, if you, like if I said, okay, Jamie, here's ten billion dollars, put it to work. You you just you no. couldn't do that no. because there these. It's not like you're allocating that much capital. Like when you're doing a deal, it's like a million dollar deal, a three million dollar deal, five million dollar deal. So th- how how does that work? I mean, it, it seems like it's kind of a catch twenty two. When you, if you find a good deal, it's great, but then there's only a certain amount of capital that the, the deal needs and therefore a certain amount of investors that can go into that deal with you. Is it, am I seeing that correctly or am I wrong? There? Yeah. I mean, like, look at it this way, George. So like Tesla is worth more than like the entire mining industry, the public mining industry. Like one, yeah, and the one company. auto industry as well. And the auto industry, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, to your point, the one good thing too is that when some of that generalist capital starts seeing, well, starting now, but continues to see the writing on the wall and thinking, you know, maybe these early stage tech companies that we're investing billions of dollars in uh, are just not going to work. Uh, we need to redistribute some of this money. If even a fraction of that, even a fraction of a fraction of that goes into the mining space, you know, mining is such a small industry that it's going to it's going to explode and we're going to see metal prices explode and even more so we're going to see equities explode. But To your point, there is a finite amount of capital that can be allocated effectively and intelligently within this sector. And we are not focused on doing the biggest deals. Uh, We are focused on doing good deals. And good deals run by smart companies, they only request a certain amount of money from investors. They don't take the moon. They don't do $50 million financings. They do five or $10 million financings. And we come in for a portion of that. So... What is the knock-on effect of that? The knock-on effect is my job is to get my members access to excellent opportunities to allocate their capital, to get them into good deals. Often that means they're small deals. So we are limited on the number of people that we're actually able and willing to take into our service. So we only occasionally um, basically open up Resource Insider to new members. We're actually at one of those points right now where we're willing to accept uh some new members and the reason for that is we've been effectively allocating capital through this you know start of a bull market we're seeing deal sizes get bigger and bigger and we're seeing an opportunity okay we can we can get more people into this and as we continue to grow we're able to go out and negotiate in a stronger way with the companies we want to invest in and say you know we can deliver you x amount of capital and then we can provide all these knock-on benefits so it's it's a bit of a chicken and egg, and it's something we take very care. We we kind of approach it very cautiously, and so yeah. far that we want to grow slowly and make sure we can meet the demands of our members. Yeah, but I mean, I was talking to Chris and and Lucas just briefly uh, the other day, and they were saying that really you guys couldn't work with maybe more than like forty or fifty people right now. Is is that yeah? Close? We did the math on this last week, and the plan is now we're going to allow in 50 new members. Uh, we're going to shut it for the foreseeable future. We're going to make sure we can go out and effectively allocate uh, or help those members allocate their money, get them big enough deals, and then we'll take it from there. So, yeah, that's our that's our current size that we're willing to expand to. Yeah, okay. Well, and it's just for accredited investors as well. That's right. So yeah, yeah. only accredited investors can buy our product. You have to be willing to self-identify, click a box saying that you are an accredited investor. And if you're not an accredited investor, it's really not worth your time because all the deals we do will again require you to identify yourself and sign documentation that you are an accredited investor. So uh, yeah. unfortunately, this eliminates a lot of people, uh, but we don't make the rules. We just operate within them. I don't know if you know this, but I like to allocate 10% of my portfolio to physical gold. Okay. And then the the ten percent of my portfolio, I like to allocate toward what I consider speculation, and then eighty mm-hmm. percent to investment that would have to pay me to own it. So the speculative side of my portfolio is where I would uh, allocate capital to the miners. So, um, and, and I know that when you go from the gold to the miners, it's almost like going long gold with leverage, because yeah, the miners exactly. go up and down a lot more. But when we talk about private placement, how would that compare to the upside or downside that you may have with just going long uh, an ETF of the the juniors or something like that? Yeah, I mean, it's magnified. You know, it's 
to be clear, it's magnified. So especially depending on which stage you're you're investing in. If you're investing in a private placement in a company that's not yet listed, you know there is a danger that that company never lists and you lose effectively lose all your money. Um, right. Of course, on any of these, of any sort of venture stage deal, the downside potential is zero. Uh, if the company gets it wrong, if they go bankrupt, these things happen in you know mining and marijuana and Bitcoin and blockchain and all these industries. However, you know the upside's huge. The upside's huge, and um, you know we are very very careful on the companies we invest in, and then you know we're looking essentially for things that we can get a five time return on. That's sort of the goal of what we're looking for. And so to date, to fully transparently on every investment we've done from inception of the service till today, we're at I think 117% return. Right now for the whole portfolio. For everything. Every winner, every loser, everything. If you held every stock today and you didn't sell at the tops, which we did sell at some of the tops and we recommended to members to sell at certain times, sure. um, you would have 117% return. Now okay. That is, I think, um, not fully. Uh, it's not fully reflective of the value of our portfolio because about four or five of those companies, and some of the ones that I think are our best companies, they're still private and they're all set to list in the next two months. So we're going to see, in my belief, those companies all list at significant premiums to what we got in it, and I'm going to expect higher returns there. But you know, when you say list, you, you're talking about going public, right? I'm talking about going public. So IPOing or some uh, cases RTOing onto a public exchange, primarily uh, the Toronto Stock Exchange or the Toronto Venture Exchange. Got it. Got it. All right, Jamie. I, you know, it wasn't that funny. We were talking in, in before recording, and we wanted to go like 30 or 35 minutes. I said, "Well, yeah. let's shoot for 30 minutes." What did we hit? 54. Five. 54. <laughs> Turns out I'm more verbose than I expected to be. No, I know. Uh, it's been really great. I really appreciate it. So for my viewers who want to find out more about what you do, you said you got a podcast and you do some content. I didn't realize that. Where can they go to check that out? Yeah, well, you can go to our website, which is resource-insider.com, or the best place to check us out is on YouTube, uh, just Resource Insider. A lot of our podcasts are there, uh, the video versions. And you can follow me on Twitter, Jamie underscore Keech at Twitter. Um, but that's the best way. I would also recommend anyone that wants to learn about this, hit the link that you're going to provide them, George. Right. They're going to see right. yep. everything we're doing. And of course, we are offering a 30% discount uh, for your guys right now, for your viewers. So if someone is an accredited investor, they're interested in learning more what they're doing, go hit that link, check it out. And you can always email me as well, which is jamie at capitalistexploits.at. And I'm happy to answer any questions people might have. Okay, that's great. Yeah, I didn't even realize that we uh, solidified that with Lucas and Chris as far as the discount. So that that's that's news to me. That's fantastic. I'll definitely put a link to that in the description. I'll probably put it in the, the pinned comment or something like that if you guys are looking for it. All right, Jamie, I appreciate it again. And I can't wait to do it again. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me on.